Hello everyone, welcome to From the Star Wars Home Video Library. I'm your host, Nathan P. Butler. This is a bit of an unusual episode here, because we're talking about a subject that, for the most part, we haven't really had a chance to delve too much into on this show. It's home video, yet not necessarily meant to be retail home video, and it's something that a lot of collectors these days tend to shy away from, uh, myself included, at least initially, because let's face it, we're dealing with something here that is relatively difficult to acquire, relatively expensive to keep up with, uh, to set up, and something that really needs to be more of an experience than just sitting back and watching a film, uh, like popping in a DVD or popping in a Blu-ray or clicking on, you know, a movie on your iPhone and just watching it from there. And that is the subject of 16mm film. Now, I delved a little bit into the idea of 16mm copies of the films way back in the second episode of this series. We're approaching like a hundred of the numbered episodes, and that's not even counting all the supplemental episodes that have us probably at about 130 almost at this point for this playlist. But way back in episode two in August of 2013, talked about how basically you had Star Wars home video releases on Super 8, the 8mm film style, which is something like this, right? Relatively small container here. This is the larger of them, and it's still relatively small. And you have these film reels. You play them on a Super 8 projector. Super 8, of course, being an 8mm film, but the sprockets are shifted and smaller so that basically you can get more picture onto each individual cell of the film. Get yeah. film. Cell of the film. Reels of film. Okay, This is not digital. This is not the uh, magnetic tape cassettes like we expect with VHS or Betamax. These are actual film reels that you play through a projector. The light goes through, projects it on the screen, the wall, whatever, as it simply unwinds as it plays from one reel onto another reel that is essentially winding as it goes so that you don't wind up with a bunch of loose film strip everywhere. But when we're dealing with these home video releases from Ken Films of Super 8 reels, you're dealing only with selected scenes. Even if you were to take both of the big reels for A New Hope, or both the big reels for The Empire Strikes Back, and jump between them over and over again, jumping from scene to scene to scene in chronological order throughout the film, you're only going to wind up with a version of the film that's going to last you like about a half an hour or something. You're not really going to get the entire experience. It's a very truncated experience. Half an hour, 40 minutes... Uh, depending on the size of the reels, depending on whether there's any dead space on them, and so on. But for 16 millimeter, that was a little bit different. 60 millimeter being a wider type of film stock, and something that usually wasn't going to be purchased at retail and brought home for viewing. When it came to Star Wars, 16 millimeter reels tended to be issued out to libraries, to prisons to military bases, places where you were likely not to just have maybe one person or a family sitting and watching something being projected, but a larger group on a larger screen with this larger film stock. And in the case of uh, Star Wars, we looked at Pugo having gone through and done those scans of the films and saw how certain things were different. You had the mono soundtrack for A New Hope and blah, 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 back in episode two of this series. And we got into sort of how it is that those wound up in people's hands. And it was a lot like the video rental library edition of A New Hope, either on Betamax or VHS. It was meant to be something to be checked out in some form or another, or sent to a place, and a lot of times eventually sent back, destroyed, stocked away, whatever. But eventually, when not being used by that original source, they might be sold. They might be donated. They might be given away. They might be raffled off. But they would wind up leaving the hands that they were meant to be in, the library, the prison, the military base, the whatever, and wind up instead in the hands of a private individual, making it essentially home video without really being home video. You can get projectors to play 16mm in the home, but these weren't necessarily meant to be home viewing at the time. But since the projectors were at home, it certainly was possible, very much like if you owned a VCR and you get their video rental library edition from the video store to watch A New Hope, well, if you were to somehow acquire that, you could watch it at home, and you could keep it at home. It was home video, even though it wasn't really meant to be that in the first place. It was meant to be housed at that video store. And in the case of Star Wars, these are things that in a lot of cases are just gone. They've been destroyed. They've been 
uh, sent back to the company. They're not something you run across very often. In fact, the 16 millimeter copy of all of a of Return of the Jedi that I saw recently on eBay, and it had gone up on eBay repeatedly before anybody bought it, uh, recently sold for five dollars shy of four thousand um, dollars. These are not cheap when it comes to the films. But there are other things that were released for Star Wars on 16 millimeter that don't wind up fetching as high of prices, but are still really awesome as collectibles and as a showcase within a collection. But something that is still relatively hard to find. Usually you have to have sort of gotten these through luck. Sorry, my computer screen just came back on over here. Usually you have to have gotten these more through luck or through hunting them than just running across them uh, uh, places like eBay and whatnot, because you're just not going to tend to find them. They tend to go from collector to collector to collector. And there is a collector by the name of Paul. And Paul actually has a YouTube channel. Uh, he goes by Meowza 3 k It's M-E-O-W, like meow, Z-A, 3, the number 3, that is, and then the letter K, uh, who's got this channel that has a ton of these really obscure Star Wars and Star Trek videos. Like, if you want to see, like, a lot of classic Star Wars video stuff or classic Star Trek video stuff, a lot of times you have to go scrounging around and hunting on YouTube to try to find these things. And he's kind of done all that work for you. It's all there, these, these really long, detailed playlists of all kinds of classic Star Wars and Star Trek stuff. Other things as well, but if you're into Star Wars, Star Trek, and you like seeing more of the classic type things, whether it's classic parodies, uh, classic trailers, commercials, that sort of thing, instead of going and hunting them down yourself, which can take a while to find the good ones, check out his channel. Again, Meowza 3K, uh, M-E-O-W-Z-A 3K. And one of the things that he collected for a while was Star Wars Home Video. And he's been slowly sending out and, and sort of divesting out of that collection uh, because a lot of the stuff that could be watched on Laserdisc and things like that now can be watched on Blu-ray, among other places. And he had in his collection what we might call the Making Of Trilogy. You remember the Japanese Laserdisc set that was released back in 1995 that instead of having... The Making of Star Wars as Told by C-3PO and R2-D2 and SPFX The Empire Strikes Back and Classic Creatures Return of the Jedi all showing up as separate titles, lumped them into one jacket and called it the Making of Trilogy. And I'm sitting back there wondering, is it Making of the Trilogy? Is it the Making of the Trilogy? Why did they name it like that? But it's those three specials that we tend to think of as the Trilogy of Making of Specials from 1977, 1980, and 1983. And he had all of those on 16 millimeter copies coming from either libraries, military bases, or elsewhere. And in the process of sort of clearing out this collection, he decided, as a fan of this show, that he wanted to donate those to my Star Wars Home Video Library and so that they could be shown on this series. So that we can take a look at this, not just me talking about it or showing you clips of what it looks like when somebody digitizes it, but what are these film reels actually looking like in terms of size, in terms of scope, not using the film term scope, but just sheer volume here, uh, and what types of things like them are out there. We mentioned the films. There is a wealth of other behind-the-scenes material and such out there as well, and trailers and things like that, all on this 16 millimeter format that wasn't originally provided for home viewing, but which nowadays, decades after the fact, have wound up in home video collections, and now, thanks to the, the wonderful generosity of Paul, has managed to make it into this collection. So exactly what programs are we talking about here? Well, we'll start off talking about the making of Star Wars. You may recall back in episode number 71 that we took a look here at the first VHS release of any kind for Star Wars, which, of course, is the making of Star Wars uh, from Magnetic Video. In 71.1 recently, we looked at the 1980 release of that that added the trailer for The Empire Strikes Back. Way back in episode number 21, we looked at that Kellogg's mail-away of the same thing with the different narration by LaFontaine instead of Conrad. Then building off of that, we saw that that special was put into a double feature with SPFX The Empire Strikes Back and then released on CED, as we saw in episode 21.1, Laserdisc, as we saw in 21.2, VHS, as we saw in 21.3, and 
and Betamax, as we saw in 21.4. In episode 89, we looked at the Return of the Jedi version of this type of behind-the-scenes special, which is Classic Creatures Return of the Jedi. And in episodes 20 and 60, we looked at the complete saga Blu-ray sets, which includes all three of these specials on disc number 9. We haven't had a chance to see real 16mm reels of these. That's real with an A, then reels with an E. Let's take a look at those now. And we can start out with The Empire Strikes Back, SPFX The Empire Strikes Back here, which is indicative of a couple of things. Sometimes you would have a special. And it would be on a large reel, right? About an hour's worth of content, 45 minutes worth of content on a larger reel, sometimes on two smaller reels. It just depended on how it was that it was put together, spliced together, uh, how it was that the library or the military base or whoever decided to store their film and so on and so on. So in the case of SPFX The Empire Strikes Back, we have our two reels of this size. You can see here, just a little bit there where it says County Public Library. This was apparently a package, at least, that had uh, been in a library system. Okay, got all your information here as far as, you know, they found out a place, return it to the film department, et cetera, et cetera, here. These are very straightforward packages here. You didn't have flashy packaging on this type of thing. It was just, you know, whatever kind of film can you can put it in, you put it into. A lot of times labeled on the side, in this case right here, it is. Right, special effects, the Empire Strikes Back there, labeled on the side. And then the reels should look relatively familiar, because it'll look a lot like those 8mm reels. And that's this. All right, you put it on your projector, and again, as it plays, it's going to turn. It's going to take that film reel and play it through the light so that it can be projected, and then wind up on a new reel on the other side, picking it up. Uh, or you can then rewind it, essentially, and then put it back onto the original here. But essentially, a large version of what we would think of when we think of those 8mm reels, in this case, those 16mm film. Let's hear the R1. This is reel number one. It's basically the first half of that special. Then the second reel, in similar container in this particular case, what you notice, again, based on the amount of content that's left, you can see a little bit through here between the actual film and the reel showing slightly less content. you got your little leading edge there that you would take and be able to feed through your projector here. Uh, if you might be thinking, like, wait a second, why is there some space left here and there wasn't necessarily on the other one? Think of this kind of like when you buy a VHS tape, and you might have a VHS tape that's only for like a half an hour show or maybe an hour show, and maybe the reel is bigger, so the amount of uh, actual tape in it is thinner, uh, or it's got a standard size of spool on it uh, to actually turn things, but when you actually look at it, uh, the film, again, is thinner. You don't need a lot of extra film if it's just going to be blank space. You want the film that actually has your production on it. Now, the other two, The Making of Star Wars and Classic Creatures Return of the Jedi, oh, one container here, one reel each, significantly Heavier. I think this is vying with the definitive collection from a weight standpoint. Got the making of Star Wars here. Notice this is a bigger reel. I got to step back or sit back further for you to see the whole thing, right? You can see the little spots here with the uh, the leading edges, right? So you can tell where one reel ends versus when one reel begins. I can speak English here properly, but again, it's that 1977 special. Released to libraries and such in 77 on 16 millimeter, that eventually will find its way to VHS in 79, which at this point could be watched at home in libraries and such in this format, 16 millimeter. And then similarly, Classic Creatures Return of the Jedi. It's actually marked, so sort of see it here, and mark there where you don't have any actual film. And again, you would put these on a projector to play them very much like Super 8, and these do have your sound built into them, as opposed to, as you may recall, when we looked at Super 8, there were some versions of Super 8, in fact, two of them, for instance, for A New Hope, that didn't have the sound built into them, and one for Empire that could have had sound built into it, but didn't, and had the sound instead on a cassette tape, right? It's a much more versatile format, but as you can see, 
because you were looking at whole productions, much larger, heavier, uh, it took a little bit more expensive equipment to be able to play, so in many cases they were restricted more to venues where larger groups could gather. Now, I've had people say, oh, be careful. You don't want to necessarily have a bunch of film in your collection because that stuff can spontaneously combust or you'll burn your house down. Don't risk it. There are some misconceptions out there about the whole idea of film stock, okay? Um, there are multiple types. Uh, you've got, for instance, uh, the two main types that, that tend to spring to mind when it comes to this era. You have cellulose nitrate. Uh, that was a form of film strip that was produced up until 1952. Uh, and then after that, there may have been some that was then used, but it wasn't being produced up to that point. And then you've got the much more common now cellulose acetate, much more common now, at least as far as, you know, uh, the films that we would tend to still see on 16 millimeter uh, for home viewing stuff that would be in collections and whatnot. It's the cellulose nitrate that's the issue. That's the one that could have a tendency to spontaneously combust at certain temperatures, but you tended to see that for 35 millimeter, 70 millimeter, and 75 millimeter, not for 16. Uh, cellulose acetate, it'll degrade on you, but it's not something that's likely to wind up spontaneously bursting into flame. Is it flammable? Sure. Any film stock is flammable, but not a hazard in and of itself by being there. You have to have a flame hazard in order to make something flammable catch on fire. Um, that was not necessarily the case with some of the cellulose nitrate type of film stock that was out there. Of course, the downside to any type of film, though, uh, cellulose acetate particularly, is this fact that it does tend to degrade over time and it starts to get sort of a reddish tint, a red shift to what it is that you're seeing. And we talked about this back, we talked about Super 8, and talked about 16 millimeter back in the first couple episodes of this series, but uh, he has taken the time, Paul has taken the time in saying farewell to these film reels to actually take a moment and show us what it looks like, to show us that quality of these particular reels, not just any reels, but these specific reels, to show that red shift in play, and at one point to give a pretty straightforward solution to being able to correct for that if you are trying to play these still in the modern day when you're dealing with uh, that red degradation. Now, I don't want to steal with thunder here or anything like that, so if you want to see that, and I would highly recommend that you check this out to see what these look like when projected, sound like when projected, how you can sort of correct for the red shift and whatnot, uh, check out on his channel, again, the username is M-E-O-W-Z-A-3-K, Meowza 3K, go on to that channel, and go into the video section, there's a video recorded at the end of September 2016, December 27th, called Farewell to Film. And that is specifically for this, Farewell to Film, to watch. He talks a bit about why he's parting with these, what some other stuff he has parted with, shows his setup and the process of showing how these look. It talks a bit about the idea of 16mm for home viewing these days in terms of being able to show it to people and collecting and whatnot. And again, gives that very simple solution to trying to fix uh, some of that red degradation here. Really, really cool stuff for anyone who's interested in this idea of Star Wars home video and the film strip versions of it, the film reels, as opposed to magnetic tape or optical discs and things like that. We want to really kind of get back to the roots of where home video was when the Star Wars films were initially being released, as opposed to when they finally were hitting home video in larger numbers. For everyone, there's a context, right? For kids today, I guarantee there will be kids who are like, wow, you've got to actually put a disc in a player? <laughs> That's lame. I just pull it up digitally. Or those who are like, growing up on Blu-ray, <laughs> DVD, what? Or those who look at uh, VHS tape or Betamax and are like, isn't that the kind the machines eat? Where's the disc at for those? Uh, I remember when I was a kid, my... Mom and Dad, we won our first VCR in a raffle. And it was this big, boxy, silver thing. Uh, all the buttons kind of clicked in a weird way when you pressed them. It had a remote, which was awesome, but the remote was attached by a wire that you had to plug in. And it had a pause button, which was huge to actually have a pause button. But it was like a lever that you clicked forward or backwards. It wasn't actually a button. So for me, 
contextually, my home video experience in a lot of ways begins with VHS, and things before that are thought of as sort of the earlier days, whereas now, you know, we got Blu-ray 3D in the home, we got digital everywhere, and you sort of live through all these different generations of home video, of home movie viewing, and to be able to see something here that is from when I was around, when I was alive, but was not ever something that our family had within the home is a very cool experience for me. And I hope it's been interesting for you as well. Again, I know I'm not showing you the clips. I'm not showing how they play. I don't have a 60 millimeter projector here that works at the moment. Uh, that's on my list of things to get uh, along with a Super 8 projector and so forth. But kind of take a moment, hop over to his channel, check out the farewell to film video. Look at how these things play and kind of, recognize how far we've come, but also how well a lot of the earlier types of video formats still hold up today in an age in which, again, a kid is probably thinking if it's not digital, it's crap, right? To, to make a bad reference to the old 1980s, 1990s Saturday Night Live Michael Myers stuff. So with that, we'll wrap up this episode. Thank you again so much, Paul. Everybody, take a moment. Go check out Farewell to Film on his channel. Check out some of those other Star Wars and Star Trek things. I think you'll get a kick out of what you find there. We'll wrap up this episode here. Thank you for watching, and may the Force be with the home video viewers.